What up, man? You know what it is. Your boy, Trent, said his sense. And of course, this is Chosen Journey. Man, I got a super special guest. I'm excited for this one, man. Um, my guy is an author, uh, award-winning. Um, he was appointed by a governor. Mm -hmm. um, you got so many accolades, bro. Uh, the, you, you know, you, you, you traveling every, everywhere. You just came from Africa. We're going to talk about that. You was just at the White House. Yeah. We got a lot to talk about. My man, D1, what's up, man? I'm here, man. I'm <laughs> here, baby. All them accolades don't even matter, bro. Like, them accolades, that that's for people who want to lean on what they right. did in the past. To me, it's about what I'm doing currently Ooh. and what I'm going to do in the future. You heard me? Ooh. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. Talk about it, man. Um, first, I want to start off, man, because um, we was talking, and you were you were in Africa, like you yeah. know. And, and can you tell me the the the, the mission of D one in Africa? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I got selected as a United States hip hop cultural ambassador. Wow, you heard me. So that's <laughs> that's. That's fire, bro. I didn't even know what it was, you wow. know, I, at first. And then I'm realizing that hip hop is something that we've created here that the world has grabbed onto and the, that the world is in love with. So it's a way for us to have diplomatic foreign relations with other countries is for us to say, sure, we're going to send some of our best and brightest from America to other co countries to, uh, to, Share and spread the 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 word of hip hop, but also the art form, and exchange creativity and business ideas, business acumen. So I was working with a whole bunch of artists from uh, Zimbabwe out there in Africa, man. And I'm talking about they fire. Oh, they they so talented, bro. So I got to go over there and represent the United States. It, it almost felt like being in the Olympics, you really? know? Yeah, because it's like you in a whole nother part of the world. And you representing the United States, but you realize more than just representing your country, that hip hop is something that we all own at this point. We don't just own it in America, you mm. know. And it was beautiful to see that. So uh, going to Zimbabwe definitely changed my life, and I got a lot of new friends, a lot of new artists that I'm rooting for, and a lot of new uh, special projects on the way because of my my uh, trip to Zimbabwe. Mm. So you were out there for like. Was it like two weeks? It was longer than two, bro. It was more like three weeks. Wow. Yeah, Zimbabwe. It was like you was living out there, man. Yeah, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I got so much footage from out there that um, I'm probably going to put a whole documentary together. And when I say documentary, I ain't talking about no 10-minute documentary. Probably like an hour-long documentary, yeah. you know, just with everything that I went through. Because when you go out there, you got the personal side of what you're going through because you're in the motherland. You know, you on you on the continent where everything originated from. So you're feeling a sense of uh, peace. You're feeling a, a sense of um, uh, being grounded and, and whatnot when you're over there. So personally, you're going through that. Then professionally, it's reflecting on like how far I've come. I started mm -hmm. rapping in my college dorm room at LSU, you know? Yeah, I'm yeah. like, dang, I done went from uh I done went from the hood to Harvard and I done went from Crazy. you know, from yeah, from the 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 dorm room to Zimbabwe, you know Crazy. what I'm saying? Yeah, from the apartment to Africa. Like I'm just like, <laughs> golly. So Was yeah. that your first time going to Africa? That was my second time, okay. but All my right. first time since I've been a rapper. Okay. The last time I went to Africa, I was 13 years old, bro. Oh, wow. Yeah, I went to Ghana, West Africa, and I hadn't even started rapping yet. But going to Ghana, that honestly changed the the course of my whole life, bro. A young dude growing up in New Orleans, surrounded by a lot of poverty, a lot of violence, a lot of street life being glorified. Mm -hmm. Going to Ghana, it really grounded me, and it made it to where my priorities in life changed. It wasn't like... I wasn't in a race to see who could be the most hood or the most street or have the the most name brands. After I went to Ghana, it was like, man, I want what they had. You know what they had, bro? They had internal joy. They had a sense of joy that no matter what they didn't uh, possess in terms of material possessions, they had a sense of joy that radiated from them that was infectious. And I was like, money came by that. And that's what, that's what I got on a mission and a quest to... Um, to obtain after I went to Ghana. And I think I think it's one of the things that makes me stand out from the crowd here in, in the States is a lot of people seem like they are searching for something mm. in terms of name brands, in terms of uh, monetary rewards, in terms of material possessions. Mm. And with me, I think one of the things that stands out is it's like, man, that dude D1, his joy is really his weapon. You know, he uses his joy to open doors, to... Um, 
form relationships to heal uh, the the hurt and, and, and the people in pain. And my joy really was uh, enhanced by seeing that joy from the people in Ghana when mm. I was 13. Crazy, man. D1's in the building, man. It's chosen journey now. Yesterday, you know, you called me last week and you were like, yo, since, man, um, is it possible to do this interview on this day? Because on Monday, today is Tuesday, on Monday, I got to go to the White House. That's a fact. <laughs> Talk about that. Like, what's going on? That's a fact, man. So I was blessed to go to the White House um, and to be working with the office of, uh, and when I say working with, just meaning uh, going there and uh, being an advocate for people all around the country who are working to decrease uh, gun violence in their cities, right? So the White House has an office that's dedicated to decreasing gun violence. But more importantly, there are a lot of uh, community um, violence, like uh, in intermediaries, like like people that are like, hey, in our community, we the ones who intervene. You know what I'm saying, and and make sure that violent crimes are on the decline. And you got amazing men and women from all around the country that's doing this. So I was blessed to go to the White House with a bunch of them, so that we could all talk about how entertainment, how uh, people in the streets on the ground how law enforcement, how everyone can work together to decrease, you know, gun violence, man. Like, dog, when we start talking about gun violence, I realized how much of my childhood and my younger life was shaped by gun violence. Um, when I was a middle school teacher, one of my students got murdered, right? But he got murdered by another one of my students, you know? That's that, crazy. Yeah, bro, that's unfortunately crazy, and very much so. Wow. My best friend, absolute best friend in life, you know, he got murdered um, in our neighborhood where, where, where I grew up at in New Orleans East. Uh, dude I grew up going to church with from the age of five and playing on a baseball team with, you know, he got murdered just in, in, in Punch a Train Park in New Orleans. Um, me, when I was in college, three dudes ran up on me and my homie, you know, put a gun out to my head at least and, you know, threatened to kill me and whatnot and they, they robbed us, they took our stuff. Um, and we were just playing basketball, you know. All of these things, bro, there's a certain amount of trauma and grief that comes with each one of them experiences. But then meanwhile, I'm hearing music at the same time as all this is happening. I'm hearing music and I'm bumping music that is constantly glorifying murder, you know, constantly glorifying gun violence. So it's this weird thing, and I don't think my experience is unique to me. In the black community uh, sense, I think so many of us have stories about how we've been impacted by gun violence, but so many of us that are hip-hop heads and listen to rap, we end up bumping a lot of music that glorifies the gun violence. Mm -hmm. And I've just gotten to, I, bro, I just hit I just hit a wall, bro. I hit a wall where I was like, yo, I got to speak out against this at this point. While I'm in the rap game, in the highest position I've ever been, I got to speak out about the hypocrisy inside of hip-hop, man. Mm -hmm the mental health issues inside of hip hop to where we are okay with making this music, but justifying the the creation of this music. Like, hey, as long as I'm getting paid from it, that's all that matter. And we are bumping it, you know, as a whole community. And then we bumping it and we going straight to the funerals that weekend when somebody we know and love gets murdered. And it's just a it's just a a, a very dirty, vicious cycle when it comes to gun violence. So I went to the White House, man, and got to uh, give a speech at the White House wow. and and really network with other amazing individuals that's doing the work to um, prevent gun violence from you know taking over their community. Wow, uh, D one's in the building, of course. Chosen journey. Can you talk about spiritual warfare versus the kingdom? Absolutely, man. This whole world is a spiritual war, and anybody who just thinks that this world is black versus white or rich versus poor or Democrats versus Republicans, man, you're not even seeing the realm that exists beyond all of those worldly things. And it's this spiritual war between good and evil. That's all it is. Everything boils down to God versus Satan. Mm -hmm. And it's going on around us. And it's internal as well. You know, it's inside of us. It's the good within us battling against the evil within us. Mm -hmm. So, well, once you know that and once you see that, you actually have a lot more empathy for people because you realize, like it says in Ephesians 6 and 12, we ain't wrestling against flesh and blood, you hear me? It's demons and principalities and spirits that we wrestling against. So when I see a man or a woman and I'm seeing them showcase 
the worst of who they are, the most evil, negative side of who they are, I just realized that they're not allowing the God in them to shine out. You know what I mean? They're allowing the devil to take over in that moment, you know? So when we see that, we don't need to battle in a spiritual fight. We don't need to battle with uh, worldly weapons, yeah. you know? If it's spiritual warfare, then they got to be spiritual weapons that we use. That's mm. prayer, you know what I mean? That's the power of forgiveness, you know? That's that's the power of uh, the word of God, you know, and and actually reading the word for the wisdom to apply to that specific battle or that specific situation that we see in front of us. And when and when that's the case, you don't have no room to be racist, for example, because it's just like you realize how surface level our skin color right, is, my right, G. Right, like right, what? Right. You don't have room to be beefed out with a Republican or beefed out with a Democrat. They got people right now online saying. All Democrats are, if you voting for a Democrat, if you Democratic, you're satanic. You know, uh, if you Republican, that means you racist. If you voting for Trump, that means you racist. If you voting for Kamala Harris, that means that you satanic. Man, shut up. Man, what is y'all talking about, man? Like, you know, you know, like, just, just stop. Just allow the best part of yourself to, to enter the chat to where you realize that Man, this stuff ain't nothing but some outer shells and outer coverings and labels and titles that get put on people. But everything that's going on is a spiritual war, man. Mm. And you got to ask yourself, what side are you on? Right, right. Um, can you talk about, like, idolatry and culture? Like, do we put those things in front of faith? Like, you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Man, idolatry is running rampant in the industry right now. You hear me? And forget the industry in the world right now, bro. People turning political candidates into idols. You hear me? People turning their favorite rappers into idols. People turning anybody with money into idols. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, no matter what somebody has down here, they fall way short when you compare them to Jesus. Mm. And when you be like, all right, so who doper? This person that's a millionaire or this person that just supersedes anything money could ever buy. You know what I'm saying? Who doper? This person who just went platinum? Or this person who, like platinum, man, you can't even compare. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what they say, you can't compete when you, or you can't compare when you can't compete. You know what I'm saying? So that's the problem is it's showing me that people are becoming addicted to this world because when you become addicted to what's down here and you become too infatuated with it, you can start to, idolize things of this world and people of this world, right. you know? Um, and, bro, let alone these political candidates who people just blindly follow behind, you know? That's something that, that's a relevant topic right now because we actually, you know, we, we in an election season and we see how divisive it is. And at the end of the day, I do believe in uh, our power to vote. I really do, brother. Like, our ancestors and just many great people uh, fought for us all to have the right to be able to vote. And if we want to be responsible citizens, you know, in the Bible, like it doesn't specifically speak about voting, but being a responsible citizen, you know what I mean? Um, rendering Caesar what he's due and just all that. I feel like voting is something that, that falls in that mix. Because if you don't vote, then you better not complain about nothing that's going on uh, that <laughs> politicians have to do with. You right. feel me? But with that being said, let's not let who, because regardless of who wins the election, the local election, the state election, the national election, we still are all called to love each other the day after the election. Mm. We still are called to pray for our political leaders mm. right after that election. So don't turn none of them, even the one you voting for, into an idol, and don't turn the one you not voting for into an op, you hear me? Because mm. at the end of the day, as believers, we still are all called to love these people, pray for these people, and coexist with these people. Mm. But the, but the idolatry, man, if we talk about it in hip-hop, bro, people want to deny it, sense. They want to deny that rap is deeper than just some surface-level music that we listen to and then we turn it off and we go live our life. No, that music is seeping into people's arteries, into people's bloodstream, you hear me? Mm. People are looking at the way these artists walk, talk, think, dress, smell, rap, spend their money. They're looking at every little micro aspect of them and different people are grabbing on to different aspects and saying, oh, that right there impacts how I'm going to live my life. Mm. So people are like turning people into, turning uh, artists into role models a lot of times. But the problem is you got these artists that when they don't want any accountability, they say, 
I'm just making music. I ain't no role model. You know what I mean? Mm. And that and that's a that's a disconnect when what you're doing is so infectious. They say that the anointing is attractive. So whatever you have been anointed to do, it's gonna be attractive to people. You heard me? Mm. It's gonna be attractive when you're walking in your calling. And you know that you can be utilizing the gift that God gave you, and it can still be very attractive, but you could be misusing the gift. Mm. You heard me? Yeah, yeah. So the elevation you're receiving ain't even coming from God, but it's coming because you're good at what you do. But that's the devil elevating you because he realized that you didn't understand that this is a spiritual war. So he's like, dang, I could just elevate this person, and they're not going to realize this is the wrong type of elevation because God not being glorified. they just going to double down on what they're already doing because they see that they're making more money, they're getting more fame. And because of that, that's putting them on a bigger platform to have more people looking up to them. It's just all messed up, bro. It's all messed up. If we got any artists... If we got any artist or any public figure that's being elevated and that's not taking that fame and that attention and saying, hey, I'm going to take this and I'm going to throw the alley-oop to God. You heard me? Mm. Y'all loving me. I appreciate y'all. But just know who I get this gift from, mm. from God. And just know I pale in comparison to Jesus Christ. You heard me? Mm. If we got anybody that's not using their fame for that, they misusing the opportunity to be a leader that's leading. But you're a leader, but where are you leading people to? You're supposed to be leading people straight to the cross. You heard me? Mm. That's the problem, bro. That's where the idolatry come in is many people are like, they are the final destination for where people's attention flow. Mm. People's attention go to them and they're like, yep, right here. And then they turn into to ball hogs. Like if this was basketball, they're like, bet, I got the attention. I'm keeping it on me. So now the, the game becomes how to keep the attention on me. I ain't finna pass this to nobody. You know what I mean? Let alone God, I'm finna keep it on me. And... People become addicted to it, bro. Um, why? Uh, of course, I mean, our flesh. It feels good to our flesh when we're getting attention, when we are admired by people in this world. They had a dude. That's why I was five minutes late for this interview. I apologize. No, bro, you forgive me? <laughs> you, you better forgive me. You're called to <laughs> forgive course. me. Okay, man. I'll just play. I wasn't even upset about it. Gotcha. That long. Now they had a dude outside, you heard me, when I was parking. And they had a dude that stopped me, and he knew exactly who I was. He knew all my music. He knew I got an album dropping in a week. He knew everything. Mm. And he just really wanted to talk about how much my music, but also my uh, my messages and, and my words, just what I speak about online, wow. have blessed him. Wow. That feels good, bro. I ain't going to lie. Like, yeah. that stuff feels good. Yeah. But if I get addicted to that, uh, God is not getting the glory. Right. You feel me? Right, right. That's what happens in hip-hop, bro. That's what happens in hip-hop. Um, I think Jay-Z said that fame is... The most addictive drug there is, mm. you know, more than heroin, more than uh, cocaine, anything. Mm. So that's real. And some people suffer from it more than others, man. I know people right now that they're so successful and they are so uh, in a relationship with God, but they still deep down uh, struggle with them wanting to be the center of attention by, by any means necessary, you mm. know. And I just look at, I look at, Man, I look at Jesus, it's like he never seemed like he went out his way to be like, I'm doing this for the attention. You feel me? Yeah. So that's just what I'm trying to be on as much as possible, bro. Like when you understand the spiritual war that's going on, you understand who your role model is and it ain't nobody in this world. Wow. Life of a disruptor evolving daily. Talk to him. That's my new album. It's called Loaded. And when I say loaded, people think of guns or people think of smoking or something like that. It ain't neither one of them. I ain't never shot a gun a day in my life. I ain't never smoked a day in my life. When I say loaded, like my dog just said, life of a disruptor evolving daily. Man, I, I know that I'm a disruptor. And anybody is going to be a disruptor when you're going against the culture and you're repping for the kingdom. You hear me? Mm -hmm. So evolving daily though that's the that's the key part this the what you're gonna hear on this album is the soundtrack to my lifestyle as i'm disrupting what's going on in the culture but i'm constantly evolving because i'm i'm facing setbacks i'm facing people that want to pop out and be my ops you heard me or people that don't like that i'm disrupting the culture you know so 
uh, you hearing the soundtrack to this music. You know, that's why I say I ain't got time to be going back and forth with people that really ain't trying to grow. They say the whole game negative when negativity ain't winning no more. This, that turn your whole life around music. I ain't scared. I ain't backing down music. I'm going to call it how it is. You getting pimped. You ain't a boss. That's clown music. You hear me? When I hit them with that, they be like, oh, hold on. He just woke me up a little bit. And I'm like, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm making the best music of my career right now. And I know it and I feel it. And... Even the collaborations. I like doing right. collaborations that make people break their neck and be like, wait, what? Yep. How that's going to work? <laughs> D1 and Project Pat. Uh-huh, crazy. D1 and Fredo Bang. Uh-huh. Like, what are we talking about? You know what right, I'm saying? Right. D1 and Raheem Devon. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I understand that it's a spiritual war. So because of that, I understand that not every soldier in the army is going to look the exact same or play the same role. Mm. So the role that Project Pat played, the role that Project Pat plays in this spiritual war is different from the role that D1 plays in this spiritual war. But guess what? LeBron James and Steph Curry, they do different things on the court, Mm -hmm. but they made for some great teammates in the Olympics just Mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So when you hear D1 in the Project Pat, your brand might not get it at first, but then when you hear that song, you're like, Oh, okay. You put that combination together, and it's lethal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the album drops. The album drops on August twenty first. So that's Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, that's Wednesday, <laughs> dog. Oh, hey, if if people hearing this, if people watching this, man, go at this point in, in my career. There's just a few things that um that I would say. It don't even matter to me, but it's just stuff that I'm like, yo. Let's do it. Let's run another victory lap. And one of them is, I would love to debut at number one in the world. You already pre-ordered number two, correct? Yeah, I'm already number two in the world yeah. on pre-orders. But <laughs> when that when that thing come out on iTunes, that would be so amazing to be 100% independent, but to be Crazy. number one in the world, man. So if anybody listening or watching this, go pre-order the album, load it on iTunes right now so that when it drops Wednesday, uh, by the grace of God, maybe we'll debut at number one in the world. You mm. know, And even if we don't, we still won. Like, we still up because we glorifying God. We got a massive audience, and we doing great. These accolades, like, they don't make or break you. And if anything, it's just another thing for somebody to read on my bio to say, oh, he debuted at number one in the world. And that don't matter as much to me as it matters to some gatekeepers. Mm. And certain gatekeepers be... They, they know that the talent is there. They see the moves being made, but they want to find any reason possible to try to deny a man of God or a woman of God from what they are rightfully deserving of, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of platforms. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, we just going to make it to where it's an undeniable stat sheet mm-hmm. over here. 